That's quite a score, Yon. Um, <laughs> it has so much great energy in it and a lot of life. And it also inhabits the sound set you're using quite well. Let's jump straight into the evaluation criteria and start with this first page. There are a few um, notation issues and so on, but I will incorporate them into the evaluations as we go. Let's start off with the first concern, and that is pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano with no pitches below middle C until the end of the passage, right? So this, this is... <clears throat> this is the really limited scope, right, that that we are looking at the piano score and uh, and they're really, you know, it, it has an extremely limited range of pitches. So if that's transcribed directly onto the orchestra, then, you know, does that make things a little limited sonically, right? Does that make the 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 opening of the piece, you know, if you hold to that same exact group of pitches, does that make it feel timbrely limited, right? If there is there no expansion, especially in such a dramatic, huge opening. So <clears throat> that leads us directly to our next concern: the thematic material repeats often, possibly sounding repetitive if ex orchestrated exactly the same way throughout. Now, in fact, <clears throat> you you have some differences between this section and this section, but they're they're fairly minute. You know, they they and and that all goes into the whole balance of how you're scoring things, right? So the differences that you have got here in the strings, um, they would be <clears throat> they would be probably. Uh, more audible and more of a contrast to the first section if you had a balance in your brass winds and strings. Okay, so here's the problem, is that you are scoring first trumpet, forte, right? And it's basically hammering away at that sounding B. You know, B, 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 yeah, da, da, da. And here you have ah two horns, right? And, and they're also getting more and more penetrating as they get up, right? So this is the beginning of their penetrating range. They're very, very penetrating range. So the high range for the horn has an enormous amount of power. And it you know, really, really cuts through everything. And um, not to say that it's louder than trumpets, but it still has a great deal of weight, right? So here you have all this weight on the B. And who is sharing this B? this sounding B with the horns and the trumpet. We've got uh, oboe here, <clears throat> which will be barely audible and actually probably just completely inaudible in, in practice. And then here we've got the second flute, which is just useless, right? It just completely has, has absolutely no strength compared to the trumpet, let alone adding the horns. So, and then on top of that, we have the same dynamic marking all the way through. Well, you know, <clears throat> in rehearsal, the, uh, the conductor may decide, well, you know, uh, I don't really want it to, to shout too much, so let's have the trumpet player and the horn players here play mezzo forte. And that might ruin the, um, the, the power that you want here. So maybe the way to get around that is to mark the winds and the strings fortissimo. So you have, um, you, you will give your upper end, your upper range, uh, on, top of the, uh, on top of this really powerful B. You'll give the upper range more strength and more color and more, more of a chance to actually compete with the the trumpet really i think the trumpet is real is the one that's going to be the loudest of course even blending it you know two horns against one trumpet uh, well it's just very very direct here you have accented staccato so they're really just going blip 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 but but here it's going bram 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 okay so one little 
tip here about the notation. I, I really feel that this style is kind of, I mean, it's, it's very, it looks very cool, but I feel it's, it's much less readable than just individual flagged eighth notes with no beam. I, I just, and same thing here, like, especially when you get into this, when you have, with this pattern, right, it looks, it's, at least it's consistent, but when you get to here, you've got a beam under a rest, and, you know, there are, there are, of course, pro players are used to reading all kinds of weird stuff, but I think that it's just really unnecessary. I think you should have individually flagged eighths. It's, it's, this is not easier to read than individually flagged eighths. It's slightly harder, right? So anything that is slightly harder to read, change back to easier to read. You see, the the whole thing about uh, beams under rests, I feel that that has its uses when the rests are part of a complex... Um, a complex pattern of rhythms which include almost like phrasing like the rest is part of a phrase right <clears throat> and uh, you know it's almost as if a note is playing it, it, instead you play a rest so here there's I don't I feel that there's no justification right that this is such a simple pattern right it's just four eighth notes in a row with a rest in between each so I think that 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 in that case the flag actually helps the score reader. It actually helps the piccolo player because I just really see the division and it's very, very simple to read. Whereas here you've added a layer of complexity, right? Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, it's just a little early in the morning <clears throat> and I'm coming back to this after a few days off. So <laughs> don't worry, I will warm up into the swing of it very, very quickly. <clears throat> Okay, so let's examine how this is orchestrated a little deeper. So here you've got uh, your E flat clarinet and your first clarinet. So first clarinet. So look, if you have nothing but like if, if un unless the the E flat clarinet is going to be going back to clarinet two, then you don't need to m mark this as first clarinet in B flat. Right, and then the furthermore, the E flat clarinet should be over the B flat clarinet. It should be higher than the right. So that just put them in order. So just clarinet and E flat, clarinet and B flat, and bass clarinet. But but reverse the order of these, right? Because it's just kind of hard to read, and it's not the standard. The standard is for the E flat clarinet to be higher. Okay, and here you're going to octaves. I'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, yump, 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 da 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 da. It's very, very cool. I have to warn you about something though, and that is <clears throat> the piccolo will be barely audible here because of the E flat clarinet playing exactly the same notes. Right here, the piccolo is in its weakest register, right? So it's um, firming up the first flute line, and if you would take my advice, you would just turn this into ah two flutes, right? Because like like I said before, this B cannot be heard over the horns and the trumpets. And you could practically say the same thing about the oboe. You could reorganize the harmony in here and just get your second winds in you know, your second upper winds away from that B, right? You have firmed up that B. That B is as strong as it needs to be. This B is as strong as it needs to be. Hmm. And... <clears throat> Now you need more weight higher up, right? Like the, you know, here you've got weight on the G sharp, which is nice. <clears throat> yeah, and then, yeah, and then here we've got this weight on the B from the E flat clarinet. Yeah, I mean, so you can reorganize this. Um, this will just a little bit better, I think. And then possibly have the first flute or ah two flutes doubling your E flat clarinet rather than piccolo, which is kind of weak right in here, right? So it's going to be, the problem is that the trumpet is going to, you know, it's has very penetrating overtones and they're going to just, um, they're going to smother the piccolo because it's just 
the doesn't have enough power here, but the but Atu flutes would have enough power. <clears throat> Okay, and then, then here in the in the um, the copied section, right? It's basically, it's a it's a copy of this, but over here um, with a few added little things. Okay, and then once again, same comments about this style of scoring. You know, this should just be flagged eighth notes, right? It should be this guy four times, not the beam under. It's just confusing. Just, you know, <clears throat> leave that to the heavy-duty notation aesthetes and just do it the readable way for your your orchestra players. So the big difference here, of course, like if this were fortissimo, then you would really hear it over the trumpets. But the, the way you've scored it now at forte, you can barely hear it at all, right? The trumpets are pulling the same game on the strings that the strings play pull on the flute a lot of the time, right? They're the first trumpets overtones are so powerful, uh, you know, accented forte, that it's just really hard to hear the strings an octave above. So if the strings are fortissimo, then you'll hear them. <clears throat> now right here you've got this plus and then a line with a, and and I I I have to say I don't I'm not fond of that. I think that you should just have a. <clears throat> you should just have a stopped mark, uh, a plus mark over every note. You only have four of them, right? And then here, um, you have to mark the circle over it. It looks like a harmonic, but it just for for a trumpet player. Excuse me for a horn player it means to play open right so you know open all right and i'm <clears throat> the way that you have scored this you're telling the copyist that the uh that the first player is playing stopped and the second player is playing open right so if you intend them both to be stopped then just just continue on with two voices on one stem. However, if you can, if you intend the um, the second player to be open, then I would actually mark it down here. Like you have the plus there, and you have the have a little circle there, and then here say etc. or sim or whatever, right? Just so that the so that the copyist knows that they're not going to accidentally drop the stop mark into their parts. Okay, <clears throat> but back to the orchestration right in here. So if you do mark fortissimo for your winds and strings and reorganize the second flute and second oboe here, then I think that this has a shot, right? Now, I'm not being critical of your piccolo part doubling the first and being very low. Okay, that is not... <clears throat> that is not um, what I intend... I think it's good that your piccolo part is low so that you can eventually reach this height up here, which is, you know, which up to here is higher than the flute can play, right? So it, I think it works really, really well going into our B sections, right? Here, if we think of this as our A section, A1 and A2, then think of this as B1 and B2. I think that the piccolo works very well in this range, but it just, you know, it, it starts to become very, very audible as you get above the staff. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's. Um, <clears throat> uh, oh yeah, one last thing I wanted to say about section A two, and that is, I think right here you can have your second violins play an octave lower than the first violins, doubling the trumpet because you just you know all you have here is one trumpet on this so. So yes, it will be way louder than this than the second violins, even if the second violins are playing fortissimo. And yet, the second violins will add something to this, I think. So that would be what I would suggest here. All right. <clears throat> now, continuing on <laughs> to our B section, uh, we have the concern of the melodic development soaring quite high. The uppermost orchestral register, you know, comparatively with the piano score, 
and the accompaniment figures covering a wide range. Okay, so part of it is picking a wind instrument that can cover that range very solidly, or in some way trading off between instruments. Now here, it's interesting, you have transcribed the pattern right onto your oboe. And <clears throat> it's, um, the thing about it is that you've got, you're doubling up your oboes here. If they were fortissimo, right, then they could, they would have a little bit more to say right in here, right? The, you know, doubling these written F sharp sounding E, right? The oboe would have more of a role in here. <clears throat> the thing that I just worry about here is that, you know, you've got your trumpets, and, <clears throat> you know, there's just, you basically just have a couple of oboists in here, and then, then of course, the flute's coming in and going beep at the end. So it doesn't really feel like the, uh, the accompaniment in the winds is very strongly scored, but here, like, in the, in the trumpet, it's very strong, right? So the oboes don't really have a lot of, you know, they, they're, they will just add a little bit of weight to what's going on with the second trumpet. But they are not really that big. You know, if you had, let's say, bass clarinet was playing this, this down an octave, right? Then you would hear that, you would hear a wind instrument contributing more to the sound picture. <clears throat> I mean, just in general, the um, there is no need, there's no reason why the 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 scope of the pitches that are involved need to hold to where the more or less to where the the hands of the pianist are right you could you could start off playing more or less the same notes as the pianist and then you could get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and then really big right there <clears throat> and we you know you if you have been watching some of the other uh, scores uh, some of the other entries and some of the evaluations and comments that I made on this, then you, you've seen that already, I'm sure. Just, you know, anything from enormous scoring all the way through to trading off between big and little and big and little, or, you know, or just a gradual progression so things get bigger and bigger and bigger. <clears throat> Once there was a score where, where everything was huge for the first eight bars, and then everything was really, really quiet or small, just the scope suddenly shrunk down. <clears throat> so I would say that in here, like, if you're happy for the second trumpet to really be dominating the accompaniment pattern and the oboes to be you know, sort of a weaker element, then that's what you'll get. But if you want more wind involvement, the more individual of voice, maybe dropping this pattern down in the bass clarinet an octave, right, would would be a way of doing it. And there's there would be a number of other ways involving the bassoons in some way. Increasing the scope of, of the scoring is basically is what you end up doing. <clears throat> now, to stay focused on the accompaniment, uh, I really like this right in here. You know, this ba-ba, ba-ba, da-da-da-da. Um, it's very, very cool. I'm just wondering if, if you could spare a... Um, if you could spare a viola to double the oboes or something, or a pizzicato viola right in here to to, to um, <clears throat> double the oboes, I think it would be really effective because right in here it just you know you have a couple of notes here in the uh, in the second trumpet which are part of the accompaniment, but that's you know it still is a little you know, it's it's a little light handed. On the accompaniment here. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me once again. <clears throat> That's early in the morning. I haven't had my cup of cocoa yet. So, um, so let's look at the uh, the melody. So the the Piccolo is taking is like is is preserving the integrity of the line, right? And then here, uh, an octave below, we have first clarinet. So first clarinet and piccolo in octaves is quite potent, and 
and it's even more potent when you consider that the piccolo is being doubled by E flat clarinet. Now here, <clears throat> you just drop out with your uh, with your E flat clarinet, but you know you what you could have done here is played is doubled these two notes <clears throat> on B flat clarinet. All right, so just doubled these two notes of B flat clarinet. I mean to say, so uh, the E flat clarinet is racing up here, and it's getting to a point where it is, you know, the next note is uh, is a little high, is a little out of range, just kind of squeaky on a E flat clarinet if you can, if it's playable at all. So I think that the that a better strategy would be to just drop down an octave, and you know, let the just reinforce the clarinet right here. Now, <clears throat> will the overtones underline the piccolo? No, because the clarinet has different overtones, but the the overtones of this clarinet are already playing way above the piccolo, the piccolo's fundamental note. And of course, the, the piccolo's overtones are playing way above it as well. So I would say to keep that same curve that you've set up right in here, the same, the, the overtones on top, right? So this is my my mouse pointer is <clears throat> is sort of kind of doing this little pretend overtones kind of thing. So all of the all of the sound and the body of tone and everything else is way up here, and you've set up a certain pattern with it, right? So I think that if you drop the E flat clarinet an octave here, uh, or or let's say if you have the E flat clarinet double these two pitches in the in the B flat clarinet, then I think you maintain that uh, that curve really well. <clears throat> now, uh, throwing the trumpet on the bottom, it really, you know, it really does mean that the trumpet is going to um, is going to dominate the proceedings here, and you know, especially rushing up here to this B. And it's kind of interesting that you chose a B flat trumpet when you could just as easily have scored this for C trumpet and had a few of these higher pitches in a little bit more of a manageable range. <clears throat> However, I think it is a good thing, like here I'm telling you to, um, I'm telling you to have the, the E flat clarinet double the B flat clarinet. But I think that in this case right in here, it's actually wise that you're just dropping out with the trumpet. See, so so by having the E flat clarinet double these two pitches right in here, you're essentially it's essentially doubling the same two pitches that are, have dropped out here, and it kind of gives the illusion that the trumpet kept going, right? Much better, because the the E flat clarinet has such a has such a um, pointy sound, right? It's not. I mean, it's not. A, you couldn't really fool anybody into thinking that it was. A trumpet by any means, but you could maintain the illusion that the trumpet had kept their hand in the game right in here. Okay, so now here we're getting to the the next little um, <clears throat> melodic development. So this is all very nicely scored in the uh, in the piccolo. I think that's absolutely perfect. So it's just a question of like. Um, you know, how can everybody else contribute? And it's interesting how you, <clears throat> how you really like drop the, the violins down here so low and, you know, just so that they rush up to this E. So, um, I'll have something to say about the, um, <laughs> the range of some of these pitches in a second and, and how they may be messing up the actual um, delineation or the, the actual separation between rhythmic phrases. Okay, but let's just focus on that melodic line. <clears throat> I mean, I see what you're doing here. You're, you're thickening up the, um, the piccolo line and then kind of dropping down. Now you don't need to do this. So I notice that you do this a lot. You you like leave a rest and then you suddenly join up later. You don't need to do that. You can just drop down and join, right? There's there's no need for the the player to rest or anything. Same thing here, you know, you could just you could just have your your first trumpet player join in on the A. 
What I would say is watch out about everybody dro dropping at the same time. Now you don't have that happen, right? So here you you are you are stopping at this D and and you're stopping at this <clears throat> this high written F sharp. But like you don't really need the rest. I think that the rest the rest sort of underlines the fact that the player has stopped and then is going on. I think that if you just immediately drop to the next note and continue to play, then it maintains the illusion that everybody is going uphill at the same rate, the same, um, you know, and, and fulfilling this line, right? The, the big illusion that we have to worry about maintaining here is that everybody is heading for the top and that there is no, that nobody is dropping down. Right, <laughs> we don't, we want the audience not to focus on that. We want the audience to be focusing on how everybody's going up and not how they are compromising. Right, the compromises have to be like a magic trick, sneaking in the lower pitches and and just convincing the ear that that it, that it didn't happen. Right, and I think that so far as that's concerned, this is this works pretty well. Um, I just think I just think you don't need these rests. Right, I think they're completely unnecessary. <clears throat> now, I will say one thing that I feel that the that the um the percussion kind of goes on for quite a bit, right? And it just you know, I think by the time I get to right in here, I'm just sick of the tambourine. I just it just is really really and you have a, like a castanet roll which I think is way more powerful than you think it is. So just imagine somebody going, yeah, 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 with that, you know, like it's almost like a clave roll, right? You know, just having, um, which is possible. What you do is you have <clears throat> the percussionist holds two claves um, in one hand, sort of spread apart in a little triangle, triangular or at, at angles to one another. And then they, then they have a third clave in the other hand and they just they just kind of rattle back and forth between them so that it is possible to do a roll on claves okay and and it's very similar to a castanet roll because it's you know it's both are made of a very very hard very very dense wood or you know in the case of today's castanets it's a it's often made of like something similar to ebonite or you know it's like a very very hard dense resinous plastic right and it gets gets pretty much the same sound Although it can crack, pretty, but so can the so can the wooden ones. <clears throat> yeah, so I I think you're maybe underestimating just you know how much the how much these instruments will be welcome, right? If there was some way to introduce a different instrument, I think by the time you get to B, I think that would help a lot. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so so here's the problem. But that's not the rhythmic phrasing, is it? What happens in the piano part? Right, and what is Foray setting up? He's setting up rhythmic phrasing that starts on the second beat, right? So you're going, yep, and then everything drops an octave in the piano part. And it goes two, three, one, two and three and one, two and three and one, two and three and, right? So that's the rhythmic phrasing. So when you keep the E the same in all the instruments with no dropping of pitch, then, then it, it sort of messes up the scheme. Then it sort of becomes a callback to this. B, 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 yeah, da, 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 right? So really, you want, do you want that? So you have to ask yourself if that's really what you want. Faya has built in a natural division of rhythmic phrasing right in here, and so do you know? Do we need the piccolo to to keep playing? It's you know up there an octave higher than the first flute. I have to admit, it's really dramatic the way that you scored it, and and when you consider you've got this kind of curve built into it and then you take off in the next bar um on that yeah da, 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 da. i feel that i feel that you are justifying things i'm not saying that it's what you did is wrong here but i'm just saying it's maybe it's a question that you didn't ask yourself right so so i am asking 
So I am putting the question to you instead, right? So that's something to consider if you decide to finalize this uh, or or make any further changes, right? Is like, do we want to feel that natural division right in here? <clears throat> so there's a there's yet another concern here, and that is uh, in my evaluation criteria, the upper middle register continues on you know, pretty much in the same exact place and everything else um, in the piano part and it's relentless if it's transcribed and there's no textual contrast to the previous passage right and so here I would say that is kind of true right the everything that you use to set up this new section is pretty much the same instruments that you used before right um, here you're adding third horn, but there really isn't a whole lot of, like the, the string section does not come in in full force, right? Or the brass don't come in as this big fat choral or anything like that. So it's, so it's generally, it's just, it's essentially the same texture that happened before. So, so that might be yet another possible concern, you know, that might be another possible way that you could rethink this page. Is there something radical you could do after you finish playing this first beat that fills in, you know, the the texture more rather than sort of limiting it to upper strings and a couple of, you know, I guess five brass instruments and and the upper winds, right? So is, is there something that you could do that that would make this a little bit bigger in you know, or is there something that you could do that subtracted elements or that traded off between elements rather than keeping them sort of homogeneous to the approach that you've had before, right? So that, you know, will it sound like, so relentlessness is a, is, you know, obviously it's a very subjective kind of judgment call. And it's not something that I'm really making here, but I'm just saying, you know, if this piece did become, if your if your score became the arrangement that was played hundreds of times, right? We would hope. Um, if it if it became um, the standard orchestral arrangement for this, would you be happy with what you've done here so far, right? Would you want things to have a bit of variation and and maybe more? progressing of the texture than you've done here, maybe f a fuller approach to the orchest orchestra, something that helped this next part to stand out a little bit from what happened before, and then lead into the next section with a lot of energy. So you, do you see what I'm saying, right? So it's not a, it's, I'm not being critical at all. It's just, I'm just, just posing the question as a tool for you, if and when you take this further. Um, so that just takes us to our next uh, four bars for section A, and the concern there is maintaining a driving staccato and transitioning smoothly to the, to the next passage. And um, yeah, starting off fairly high in the bassoon, certainly certainly easily playable by your first bassoonist um, in a, in any pro situation. Yeah. All right. So, so I think that if you're going to have trumpet scored like this, there is zero reason to have your second flute right in here, doubling. doubling some of the uh, oboe part at first and then kind of moving to this higher roll. Yeah, look, I, I mean, you are scoring a lot of kind of somewhat inaudible flute in here, right? You're, you're basically scoring flute in places that is really better, you know, it's, it's much more strongly represented by other instruments, clarinet and so on. You know, I mean, why can't the, why can't it be the, why can't the second flute be supporting the first flute, ah, too, right? And then you have, like, three instruments. You have three flute family instruments on the same line, which is, is quite, you know, it's quite powerful. It has a nice, solid sound. 
Yeah, and then, you know, right in here, like, are we going to hear, are we going to hear this note when it is being doubled by these other instruments, the um, first horn and the, and the first trumpet? And then right in here, you know, the, the other instruments are playing some of these pitches quite well, and, and there's almost no support on the upper line in here for the flute player. And you're keeping your strings very low. They're not doing a whole lot to support the upper wind. So it's, it's a very bright, windy sound in here. Windy sound. That sounds very weird. But yeah, the the accent really is on on the the winds being more trebly, right? And and it's nice the way things are filling out. But we're not really filling out into a, a texture where the strings are very powerful yet, right? Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's move on into B. So I felt that this B section was really nicely scored. There are concerns in my evaluation criteria about contrast of color, breadth of texture, and middle register scoring, and I feel that you address a lot of those. Uh, your sound set sounds, <laughs> sounds almost like like horns right in here, you know, bah, 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 bah. So just because you have everybody, um, you know, you, you are quadrupling the line right in here, and that's kind of fun. I mean, there will be that kind of a forceful sound if you do that, but, you know, just whatever it is in pizzicato that, that kind of resembles a horn sforzando is being brought out by the sound set, which is kind of fun. Yeah, okay, so so here you, like, you know, you are opening out into this, you're opening out into this really full, this beautifully fully orchestrated um, uh, development section based on the opening, right? So, so it's, you know, it's really quite, it's really quite big, and I'm kind of wondering why some of these features couldn't have happened before, right? This sort of fuller, bigger kind of kind of approach couldn't have happened on the first screen. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, it's 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 pretty big in here, and you st you're still keeping the the um, first trumpet in the game, so. It's just a question of proportion, like how long can you keep the same players doing the, some of the same roles, right? Without really changing the color that much. But, I mean, there is a difference here because it's a, it's a fuller, like the, the scope of things is broader. But there's still, like, you're very still light, you're quite a bit light on the low end, right? But that's, that's fine. I think that it works with the, the uh, doubling here that you've got in the... Um, bass clarinet and contrabassoon. That's that's very very cool. It's it's totally playable. I'd say it's you know it's a bit it's a bit nimbler than your standard contrabassoon part. But if you have the bass clarinet above to um, you know to kind of um, uh, to um, to to sort of correct it and and to kind of you know, take the top end uh, make the top end sound elegant. Um, then I think that you're fine. <clears throat> yeah, it's just, just, yeah, very, very direct, and that's what's that's what's needed right in here. Uh, of course, uh, you didn't have any harp on the first screen in this kind of scoring, and now is the time to talk about it. And that is really that the way that you have scored everything here, the harp really does not have much of a chance. Um, <clears throat> I mean. Despite the fact that you have got uh, bass clarinet and contrabassoon, which probably wouldn't overwhelm the harp on on their own account, you've got trombone, you've got you got heavy brass, very very plentifully scored right in here, and then you have this ferocious pizzicato in here, which although it's not playing the same notes as the harp, it still will absorb the harp's sound, right? So. 
so it's just you you laid a bunch of traps for the for the harpist and and i mean it's perfectly it's a perfectly playable part for harp but it's just not very it's not very likely and then here you have horn uh basically playing octave versions of what's going on here in the harp and the 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 horn also absorbs the sound of the harp and you know it's, and also it's like it's just loud scoring like you could get away from all of my warnings about things that absorb the sound of the harp and just sort of look at it realistically and say, you know, I've got this massive low wind and uh, low horn scoring. And, and you know, and, and that is just really, you know, it, you won't be able to hear the harp in there. Like towards the end, like on the next screen, the harp would be definitely audible. But right in here, it just does not have a chance, and especially when you have this doubling at pitch with the double basses uh, of what the harp is doing, then it that will absorb the sound of the harp as well. So the harp really isn't accomplishing a whole lot on this screen. So like, you know, in, in places where things are medium loud, if the harp is doing something that nobody else is doing and it's doing it in a slot that's that you know that is very very easy to hear that's what you want but like the harp doubling things that are that are being played very very well by other instruments is a little less successful see so here you're you are sort of relying on the harp for the plucked sound over these three bars rather than the double basses and i would have said just keep the double basses in the game or have maybe have the um, the cellos come in for just a slight diff slightly different kind of a plucking sound, but the, you can't rely on the on the harp right in here to really give sufficient weight to what's going on in your bass clarinet and contrabassoon parts. Okay, <laughs> so um, I'm skipping some of the evaluation criteria here because I I don't feel I I just like there isn't enough to say about it. Like I, I think that. Like, for instance, the high interjecting notes, uh, the high interjecting E's, they probably, you know, like here you've got a bit of glockenspiel and so on. I think that rethinking the role of the harp, especially with this kind of stuff, um, you know, adding, having it being played maybe by winds or some other instruments, um, then then I think that you would just need to rethink anyway. So there's kind of no sense in, in talking about it too much. But I really love the idea of um, <clears throat> of the pizzicato being really, really strong. I don't feel that that this is enough. Like ba 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 da 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 da. See, it's like you can really hear. Like as soon as the pizzicato, excuse me, as soon as the pizzicato starts here, you really can't. You know, it's like it doesn't really connect together. And one of the problems is, of course, in the piano part, <clears throat> it trades off from hand to hand, and that gives the illusion. That those are two separate things. That there is a there's a left hand part that goes ba ba bum, and then there's a right hand part that goes ya da 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 goes excuse me rest da 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 da. Right now here you sort of have connected things a little bit more deliberately on the A, but why can't the cellos just start ba 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 ba? Why can't they just start their their pizzicato line right here? Right, so this can fold into it, and then it can just be all pizzicato from that point. And for that matter. The viola could be coming in pizzicato on the E, right? Because it can reach that note. So it could be A, E, A. And then here on the viola, you could stop on this um, <clears throat> on this A just for a, an eighth note and then start on E right in here. And then they could all be playing pizzicato together. And see, like here, you're doing that. You're, you're basically doing an interpretation of that lower line all being connected together, right? But I think right here it just starts in the middle of the bar too too obviously, right? So have the cellos start earlier, just to really make that line connect. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So let's talk about the way that this. I mean, I could I could talk about this for like forty five minutes. I better not. So let's talk about this part right in here. Our concerns are keeping the triplets from overwhelming the melodic line and having, you know, interpreting the widely reaching left hand patterns, right? So we already talked a little bit about how, I mean, I don't feel that the harp has a strong enough um, projection to really play a role here, a useful role. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I also warned against 
making the harp the um, the instrument that is relied upon here, right? So it seems to me that like you know, you, like here you're giving up the plucking sound of the double basses and sort of having the harp supply it, and it's not strong enough. So uh, you know, throw in the cellos if you want a change of timbre here. All right, so I just felt that was really important to reiterate. So now. <clears throat> I feel that the, the horn is nicely used right in here. I think if you were going to use horns here, then there is zero reason to use flute. The flute is just like not contributing anything. If the horns were marked piano and the flutes were marked forte, then you could hear the flutes. But as, as it is now, the horns basically are going, I mean, the horn already has a similar enough timbre to the flute in some ways um, that like the, they just basically will absorb everything that the flute is doing here. So the flutes are completely unnecessary. Um, <clears throat> I love this idea of throwing in a little bit of clarinet, though, to just kind of reinforce this. That is actually nice, you know, and then just coming in with the clarinet. See, I think that this is doing everything that you want the flute to do. So you could have the clarinets or one clarinet doubling. Yeah, I see. So, so, you, so this is second clarinet. All right. So look, <clears throat> on your first page, just say clarinet in E flat and then parentheses underneath that name clarinet 2, right? So that way you will avoid a lecture from your orchestration coach or your copyist, right? So that that way I know that there's a reason why there is a first clarinet. But <clears throat> I still feel that the that the E flat clarinet part should be over the B flat clarinet. And then like when you like say you have a page break right here, then you can just join um, the two parts together, or you can have the you can reposition the staves, right? So the E flat clarinet part that was above becomes the B flat, the second B flat clarinet part below. Similar to how you would have a piccolo part on the upper staff become the third flute part below the flute staff going up forwards. Yeah, so just on the page break, have your E flat, have your E flat clarinet above, and then on the page break, page break, go to a B flat clarinet, second clarinet, staff below. Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, so once again, I just feel that this is not, this is not really contributing anything, but I think that that the um, that the horn melody is very nicely done. Just the question is like, do you want it just to? If you, do you want there to be no basic change in the approach here? I like the uh, the way that the triplets are handled here. First clarinet and is this a two bassoons, one bassoon, two bassoons? What's going on here? If this is just first bassoon, I would actually recommend that the second bassoon double the top here and actually just have your contra bassoon player going bump, just go e e e. E E E E, and I just think that that's a, a better division. So second bassoon will be going bump bump bump, and then have them overlap on the on this E, and then just have the contra bassoon grab that. So if this is only if this is really intended to just be first bassoon like before, then yeah, have the second bassoon support the contra bassoon and take take some away, take away a little bit of its um, of its job there. But <clears throat> yeah, it's a it's a very cool combination. Very very woody to double the um, uh, Shalomo register of the clarinet with the uh, sort of um, lower tenor register of the bassoon. <clears throat> it's a very it can be a very intense sound, and it, that's actually a pretty good strategy right in here because you're you know. It gives you a little bit of power, like right in here. You know, the, one of the problems is that actually the melody could overwhelm the trip, the triplets very, very easily. So, I mean, there are ways around this. You could mark the horns down, right, um, <clears throat> or the winds up. Probably the horns down. They could be playing mezzo forte here. Yeah, you know, bum 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 just like one degree down below. But like I think as it is, it's probably fine. I would say don't mess with it. You don't have to do harmonic mixing here. I think just so long as the um, as the conductor knows what they're doing, that the triplets won't be overwhelmed. And maybe it should be A2 bassoons. 
Anyway, um, but yeah, it's an intriguingly scored uh, page. Now here, I feel like as everything is calming down and pulling away, the harp has a chance of being heard. But I wouldn't score at piano, right? Everybody else can be piano. They can be going down to pianissimo. The harp should come in at mezzo piano or mezzo forte, right? Diminuendo to piano. And everybody else can be pianissimo and so on, right? All right, so <clears throat> um, uh, in these... Um, in these um, challenges, just you know, I know it, it. It seems illogical to put the uh, the rehearsal mark right here, but that's where I need it. Okay, so everybody out there who you know feels that I made a mistake, or you know maybe that was a careless error or something, um, to put the to put the uh, rehearsal mark before the double bar, but there is a point to it, right? That's because this is the natural division. This is like where the uh, not only is it where um, a certain level of um, Patreon supporter might finish their their um, <clears throat> their score if they were only you know supporting up to a certain point. It's not just that; it's also because you know just in terms of me evaluating things, it's way way easier to think of this as the beginning of the next section because the the way that it's set up is really you know leads into the other part right and it and it and it's something you know, it's sort of the springboard for me starting my lecture so so please be helpful to me and put the you know don't put the c on the on the double bar or whatever i don't think that this will be as big an issue in the next score but yeah just it's just very helpful all right <clears throat> so i left a clue in the in the um template and in the um, in the little piano plus plus piano score video, and that is by making a note of the pedal mark that was underneath this bar, right? And why did I do that? It's because what is the effect of putting the pedal down under those pitches? It means that every pitch that is introduced by the piano, which you have interpreted here in your clarinet is sustained to the end of the bar, right? And that, sus that sustaining appears to build, right? That, you know, it's an illusion that like the, the notes that were played a little softer by the beginning of the bar don't really get louder, but there's no reason why they couldn't, right? Like you have here in the cellos. But why couldn't every pitch going up have been uh, doubled by another instrument, right? Could the next E have been doubled by viola and held and crescendoed. And then this, um, it's actually a D, sounding D. Um, and then this uh, sounding G sharp uh, is easily playable by the second violins. That could have been held, like you could have gone divisi, like lower second violins hold the G sharp. And then right here we have a sounding B that could have been played and held by the second violins going up. So like the, the clarinet would play over the top of these notes that were building up, right? Or you could have also done that in brass as well, right? <clears throat> so, I, you know, I just feel like if, if you feel that this part right here is missing something, it's like it doesn't really quite lead into this next section with a lot of power, that's why, right? I mean, is, is it enough just to have a rolled timpani and, some, and a push with the... Um, with your lower strings and contrabassoon, right? I, I don't know if it really is. It doesn't feel like it has this big all argondo expansion and then releasing into the next section. <clears throat> the other thing too is <clears throat> maybe the clarinet can crescendo to forte, but would it be possible for the other instruments to crescendo to forte or mezzo forte and then then have a, just a slight diminuendo into the next bar. It's like, say, crescendo to forte and then diminuendo to mezzo forte so that there's that sense of release, right? Right? Rather, as opposed to... You see what I mean? It's like, so you have this strong note at the beginning... 
<coughs> and then a very subtle texture right afterwards. Maybe it's better to release into the downbeat as being the beginning of the subtle texture. <coughs> right, and then here you've got a bit of Bispigliando right in here. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So I think that if this, if you really want this to work, then the bass clarinet has got to be piano, not mezzo forte, right? Because <clears throat> just the overtones alone from the uh, the bass clarinet here would be enough to completely bury the bisbigliando of the harp. So it's just like, so what have you got here? You've got this you know, sort of tenory voice guy say, saying, hey, there, there's doing these two notes over and over again. And then an octave higher, you have this person saying, hey, by the way, hey, um, I'm whispering here and I can't really be heard very loudly, right? So it's literally, bispigliano means whispering, right? So, you know, what kind of whispering can be heard if the clarinet near, you know, over, kind of covering the same the same general area is playing forte and the bass clarinet is playing mezzo forte an octave lower right this bisbigliando doesn't seem to be very very likely now if you drop everybody's like let's say you crescendo sforzando right and then diminuendo to piano right to piano espressivo with lots of hairpins expressive nuances which I'll talk about in a minute. And then you also have your uh, bass clarinet playing below at piano or, or pianissimo. And you just really back that back off on the tambourine. The tambourine is, is basically its kind of sound. It's white noise sound is bear, is also going to bury the bisbigliando in the harp. So if you do if you made those changes, then I think that the bisbigliando has a chance in there. Otherwise, it's just it's you know it's a little wasted. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and so, you know, this could be soft, uh, and little nuances, right? Da, 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 da. And make this into portato by having a slur over the tenuto marks. Um, uh, 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 da, uh, diminuendo, and then crescendo again. Da, uh, 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 da, uh. Uh, uh, so a little slightly diminuendo, even though it's going into an accent. And then crescendo, diminuendo, da 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 da. Da 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 da. I like this formato in here. That's very cool. Da 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 da. All right. The way that this passage winds up, or first half of the passage winds up, so cool. Right. I don't think the harp is going to play much of a role here. But yeah, you don't you know you don't need the diminuendo here, right? Right now here, go to forte or poco forte or something like that. Right? Since you don't have the bispigliando to worry about overwhelming, you could be a little louder in here, right? And maybe bring in the ah, maracas. Very fun. And then you've got the, you know, you know, about the only problem in here is that you don't, like, throughout this whole thing, is that you don't have that that really cool um, thing that Faya has got in his score, that, you know, the, that sort of tension between the, um, between the, the B flat below, going back and forth between B flat A, B flat A, B flat A, and then the little alternating note above, right? So we kind of don't have that, you know, there isn't that, you know, so this doesn't have as much nervous energy to it, right? So, um, yeah. And here you're saying, um, you're basically giving a, you're saying to be very expressive and song-like to the accompaniment part, right? So this is, this would be intended for the, um, for the, um, for your solo part, not for the accompaniment part. However, <clears throat> and the same thing here, you know, you, you wouldn't want to tell your your um, accompaniment 
role to be expressive and song-like. However, the thing about it is, if you just add the little nuances, right, add some, you know, crescendo, diminuendo, hairpins, and so on, to really lead the player through this, then you don't need this, because that is telling them the same thing. The, um, uh, <clears throat> Faya puts that into his piano score, and, you know, because he's just, he wants things to be really, really free. Uh, he wants the pianist to, um, to interpret the melody and to, and to add their own inflections and everything else. And that's fine for solo piano. But when you have like 106 people playing at once, then you, you cannot quite, you know, you can't just leave it up to chance or leave it up to the player or whatever. The player wants guidance. They want to know what you imagine as being an expressive line right in here, and then they want to play that line. So, um, so yeah, so just skip the bien chantant and the, uh, you know, and just, just write it in, you know, you know, write in the, the, the song-like qualities. Okay, and then, you know, one other thing I think is possibly a problem here is that, like, just the way that the, that the piano kind of, like, now, obviously, the pianist has got their foot down on the pedal here, right? So would it be possible to slur these, right, rather than just going bonk, bonk, right? Da, da, rather than da, da, da. It just feels really stompy playing each, you know, throwing each note into, like, right here you're going stomp, 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 right? So what if it were a, what if it were a slur? Da, da, da. Right. Okay, and I would say, like, speaking of slurs, I think that slurring these, uh, these each slurring each uh, bar was probably the way to go here as well, just to make it smoother. And of course, adding nuances to this and so on. Now, um, <clears throat> one little comment about this is that I noticed that you really like. I think you might have listened to the piano part and just kind of added a lot of little rubato bits and so on in, you know, in your, uh, in the, the tempo map of your mock-up. And I would say, I think you need to keep it simpler than that, right? You could, you could say, um, right here, you could say doppio più lento ma sempre mosso. Uh, rubato and then just leave it up to the conductor but don't put it don't put that much like it just started to feel a little unnatural in the mock-up I mean the 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 little tempo nuances that I put into my um, into my template are ones that the pianist does in a really obvious way not the you know not the tiny little tempo corrections and tempo manipulations um, that we hear pianists do in the beginning. I just feel that with an orchestra that doesn't really work as well. I think an orchestra needs to have a really even beat in in moments like this. <clears throat> so um, that's that's the strange thing though, because like in my template, I, I really showed a pattern of something that would, you know, that would lead to those, the next concerns in the list of, of evaluation criteria, which is like managing the sense of restraint by pulling back on the tempo and, and pulling it back, maybe back a little bit on the dynamics and then having a burst of energy, right? When you get to hear, you know, da, da, a little softer, da, 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 da. Right? So I think that maybe you need to rethink that, you know, look at the what I did with the with the um um in the um the template, sorry, early in the morning. Look at what I did in the template. See if that like just and listen to how pianists interpret that. Like you're very, very it seems like you're keenly aware of you know that's just sort of the the real um the real active rubato in these passages but but perhaps that 
you know, you got into other things as you were scoring through the rest of this and, and weren't listening to that because which here here is where I feel it is really essential, right? Is like because like you're basically stating the same theme again um, in a different place and just adding more flurries to it and then progressing it into something else, and the progression into a new place. Um, I, I, that's where the poetry really comes in. Da 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 a little slower. Da 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 Now picking up speed. Da 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 Really making a point. Da 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 Right? So, um, you know, then right here is like saying rubato here, right? And then, um, and then really giving the the conductor the option to pause slightly when they get to this beat and then they can just pick up like it's almost like throwing in a slight pause here and then retardando what what really what happens in the piano part it's actually onomato Dun, 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 dun. Right? So, um, yeah. Maybe that doesn't need to be underlined so much with percussion in there, right? Maybe that letting the oboe player and the viola and the viola section like work together and just for a very, very intense sound. But I mean, all of this other stuff is, you know, you, you keep it simple and I think that that's really, really wise. Right, and then just you know, nice horns right in here and timpani and here I think the percussion is very, very cool. And I, I think actually the harp has got a chance right in here. Right. This is these could you spell all this out as a as a um, as a glissando? Could all of these pitches be spelled out? You know, you could have a an A flat and a um, and a G sharp. And then you could have a C and a B sharp. Do you know what I mean? Could you could you spell everything out as like um, an harmonic um, glissando, and then like then the same thing here and so on. So anyways, think about that. It's just a way of making it simpler, rather than like the way that this is clustered and it's just really it's hard to read. You didn't separate um, you didn't separate the stem here, which is what I would have wanted. If you want this hand over hand, you would have like. Um, left hand and then the right hand would be taking the stem pointing down and then halfway through this you break this and have a stem pointing up and that would be the left hand coming over again so left right left um and you just really have to throw in the separation in there okay and you know this is this is all fine i really love the idea of um uh, putting the oboes together with uh with the uh, violas, I think that's a very, very cool thing. You know, because just it just suddenly makes it a, a very, very intense sound. But maybe this would be a good place to go to Atu with the oboes and just get that almost trumpet-like sound. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is interesting right in here. Um, like, you know, a part of me is looking at this and thinking that like, uh, well, you know, the bass clarinet part is slurred and, you know, that kind of goes against the nervous energy of the violas. You know, la 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 So this should actually be a uh, quarter note with, um, a with of course, absolutely without a uh, beam except with a uh, 16th note uh, measured tremolo beam on it, right? So just make that into a, rather than having this as kind of pointless. Just have a quarter note with a with a um, with a double uh, like a, a double beam um, measure tremolo those two slashes right okay and the other part of me that looks at this and says well you know like it's all really paced Right. Okay. So just like so there's a part of me that really resists this, but then I like you know looking at the way that you harmonize this, right? Right at the end, you know, that is such a Spanish thing, you know. And obviously, like it's it's underlying the um, 
the broken octaves of the uh, of the piano part, right? That just this um, this harmony leading towards you know sort of this this weird kind of cadence right in here, leading back to this E. So um, has my total approval. I think it's incredibly original and, and and yet very traditional, right? It's a very original way to be traditional here. So very very nicely done. Um, yeah, and these kind of grunty low notes. Uh, I would say mark this staccato to match the pizzicato, and then it makes a lot more sense because, like, you know, I don't think you want these to grunt. I think you want them to go doink, 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 doink to sort of match the um, the pizzicato of the double basses in here. This is yeah. I just think that it's. You know, it it did something I didn't expect, and I think that that's a good that's a good thing, right? All right, so now we're getting to the agitato, really, really, really fun. Right here in my evaluation criteria. Um, I write in that, you know, maintaining the rather hallucinatory feeling of the music despite fairly straightforward building blocks. Oh, all right, so you're missing something here and you're missing something here, right? So you're going slow, you're going slow to what? What does it say in the score? Something you have to put in your score, you know, you have to put this in your score. It says in the piano score, doppio più lento ma sempre moso. So in other words, twice as slow but a little faster right <laughs> so so that's not marked here so the the con if the conductor didn't see that he might just slow down what happened before and then stay slow but that would still be too fast right so like you you must have made the correction in your tempo map but um in your mock-up but then you know agitato and then i gave you a clue in the um in the um in my template and that was that it goes to piumeno a poco rubato right so it's like it the agitato does not stay i mean it, it still is an agitated kind of a style but obviously you know if it's if if you're going to return to that kind of harem scarum kind of playing right in here which you know would like if you listen to the piano playing it is nothing it is nothing like what is scored here which is you know just basically is there's no tempo change at all right so i think you need to bring back the tempo here so that you can and that also contributes to the sort of hallucinatory effect right you know that these these people have been dancing all night and they're starting to hallucinate right um they're you know they're seeing pretty colors as they as they look around and as they dance it's turning into this big swirl right um so <clears throat> right in here you're scoring your uh flute fairly low right but it's still you know it still has a it's still audible it's this is still all fine right and you're a little bit on the edge here in terms of tone weight, but it's still okay, right? And then here, you're going to a higher place. And so that's all fine. So the low flute scoring right in here, I don't have a big problem with. And especially like teamed up with clarinets that are playing softly. I think it works really, really nicely. And this is all really nice in here. The bass clarinet and the bassoons working together with the... Um, the cellos and and like with the cellos just all playing da -da 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 -da. i think that it you know you don't really need the double basses at all yet right that's i think that works all really really great and you know, of course bringing in the horns i wish that you had scored your horns on two staves it just is just easier to read but i mean i can see like the problems with you know vertically and so on all right so yeah, and sort of continuing on in this way, I feel it's, you know, it, people may be wondering why I sort of breeze over some of these two Ts, and it's just because, like, it's hard to get wrong, you know? I mean, what is going on is just very big two-fisted scoring in in the in the piano part, 
and it translates really beautifully to the orchestra. Yeah. Yeah, and this is very cool, like to, to, you know, kind of alternate between trumpets playing the harmony in here, and then horns coming in to play the offbeat harmony with, uh, um, <clears throat> with, uh, I guess, you know, two trumpets going da 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 da. Okay. And once again, you get a little star for um, remembering the um, the alternation between the you know high and low, high and low, and then lower in the bass part. I think that's great. It's really effective. It's something that Faya scored. I think it's important to include. Um, about the only thing that I wonder about, though. See, I always have these caveats. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, is whether or not, like, the sense of octaves, right? So, like, the, we've got a triple octave in our cellos and double basses. But what have we got going on here in the winds and, like, we've got the, we've got the bass clarinet basically doubling the kind of middle lower string part in here, the, the, the lower Debussy cellos. But the contrabassoon is basically doubling the um, the bass trombone and tuba part, right? So I don't know. I mean, if there's some way to spread things around a little bit more, I think, you know... I mean, do, does the bass trombone need to play so rock bottom here? It is, it is kind of getting into sort of slightly dicey territory. Maybe it could, like, just kind of stay in the same place, right? And just have the tuba uh, jump up and down. But, I mean, it's playable, but it's just kind of, you know, kind of a ugly sound way, way down there at the bottom. Very fat, kind of snarly sound. So, I mean, if that's what you want, that's like a... Yeah, but it's just, you know, low F sharps and... I, I kind of try to avoid... It's all possible, but I kind of try to avoid throwing my... My bass trombone way down there unless it's really, really necessary. I'm not so sure that it's all that necessary here. You know, because you've got so much weight already with the tubo down there and so on. Anyhow, um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, about the only thing that, that I feel is maybe excessive here is, like, the harp just doing this over and over again. Uh, you do not need to write out every note uh, in a little sort of template for the glissando. All you need is just a little, um, is just a little harp um, little harp symbol, uh, little uh, pedal diagram, right? That shows things like it could either be like the cross with the little um, the little pedal diagram showing, or you could write out a, um, a pedal diagram in in uh, text, right? So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so that's the way to do it. This is just really, this is kind of old fashioned and just really not needed anymore. I'm seeing it in a lot of, a lot of entries and just seriously, folks, the, um, it's more of a hassle for the harpist to sort of read every, read all seven notes and say, okay, I put this pedal here, this pedal there, that, you know, like, and then, and so on. Did they remember such and such? But when they have, when you have the pedal diagram instead, then they just, you know, the feet just make sure, you know, the, the harpist looking ahead, they just just make sure and they set it in there. But, you know, having said that, like, how many of these can you do, right, before it gets to be too repetitive? What if you did it the first time and the last time? You know, ba, 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 da, 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 maybe throw one in here. Start the glissando here, right? And have it cover as many notes as you possibly can. So, like, go up to, you know, F sharp ottava. Right, and just really cover, just like the widest amount of notes. Yeah, so I I really don't have any other issues about this. I think that's all very cool. Okay, but like once again, tempo, right? So what is going on here? It's like it's just such this impassioned kind of thing. 
Did you notice that in the template, in my template, I wrote Roland Tondo here? That's what all the pianists do, and it's like pushing a rock uphill, right? And then suddenly they're fast again. Agitato. Right? So I think that that's just really important. Right? But in order to get that, for in order for this to be audible right in here, what needs to happen? Well, you need to end on, or you need to start the bar on a on an eighth note, right? And then if you throw in like a little comma, so there's a slight gap here, and I would say also like underline that comma in certain parts by just having a um, having a flag instead of a, instead of a, a beam, right? So you just want want a sense of disconnection between the end of the previous phrase and the beginning of this sort of very excited stuff. So the way that you've got this here, the um, pizzicato of the cellos being mezzo forte, basically this is going to swallow what's going on here, and it's also going to be hard to hear the harp right in here. So, I mean, I, I see what you want to do. You want to double, the, the, the main thing to do here is to double the harp and the, and the clarinet parts, right? So... Um, so you need to balance everything way better, right? So I would say, um, mezzo forte on the on the clarinet part, fortissimo on the harp part, right? And then you can go to mezzo forte on everything else, like mezzo forte on the pizzicato. I think I think that will work sort of. I still feel that the pizzicato is going to swallow a lot of what's going on in the heart, but that's you know sort of the way that you have set things up. You know, you could get rid of the the pizzicato entirely uh, and the clarinet right in, excuse me, in the cello right in here, and then maybe give the give it to the bass clarinet, and the bass clarinet goes staccato do, 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 with a um, harp, and then yeah, it is doubling those same notes in the clarinets. Or you could drop it an octave too, just to see how that would work. Um, but yeah, just like I think the pizzicato doubling the harp part is not a good is not a good thing. Fortissimo harp, everybody else mezzo forte is what I would say here. Yeah, and then and then you really have to mark that you're coming back to mezzo forte here, right? And then and then continue on fortissimo on the yeah. Okay, and the other thing here, <clears throat> all right, so um, apparently I've been told in some comments in under some uh, evaluations that this is the default for Dorico on cymbal parts. Okay, Dorico, don't do that, all right? For concert music, this style, the, just the traditional style of, um, of note heads is fine, all right? Just like... Uh, X note heads really should be for like uh, crossover scoring, especially sharing a staff. You know when you've got like a ride cymbal and a and a hi hat and a and a crash and so on and so forth. But please don't 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 turn this into a default. I think that's wrong. Now that now of course what, what I've what I've been told is that it's very very easy to fix. So, um, but this is just this, exactly the same thing as how like. Um, a standard thing for Sibelius is to have a um, is to have a uh, a key signature on horn and trumpet parts, right, in concert music. So, you know, that's that is something that really should be you should make a conscious decision to add a um, you should make a conscious decision to add a uh, a key signature to a horn or a trumpet part in concert music, you should make a conscious decision to make your note heads X heads in concert music for a, for a you're saying crash symbol, but you hear you're adding like a roll, right? I think you just mean that this is like a suspended symbol or just symbol, and then here you should say sus, right? Yeah. Okay, and then here, this is obviously a suspended symbol, so I think you need to work a little bit on that. Yeah, so seriously, I, 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 Dorico, look, some people who are members of this community work on Dorico. 
tell the Dorico people to stop doing that, all right? Version whatever, you know, 6.3 or whatever we're on now. Just please change that. Okay, so, um, yeah, I, I like that. Like the flute's going ticka 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 ticka. That's all very easy. Um, and here I think you could use like and all of this. You should use that same notation style that you're doing here, right? Um, the uh, measured tremolo, rather than spelling everything out like this. And yeah, so I mean this all works nice for me. I th I think it's I think it's very cool. <clears throat> okay, so right here, um, this is not poco ritardando. This is just a straight rallentando. Okay, it's in fact it's like it's a rallentando and then a dimin sorry a rallentando and then a ritardando. Really, it's just it really is bringing things and and I think that that right in here you possibly could have done enough you or you could have done a little bit more to transition into this smooth area right here. I think if everybody is going to be really, really soft, I think that the the downbeat should be soft. Not, you know, da 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 You know what I mean? I think everything needs to be da 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 ba 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 You know what I mean? I think it should just this part should just float into the next part. And um, one thing that I didn't really address before was the authenticity of style and choice of melodic voice, right? And I, th I think that that, you know, a, a low flute works really, really well. I'm not so sure how it works with the, uh, with like a <coughs> first horn. Um, you know, I, I just feel, I, you know, there's, okay, so there are two problems here, right? All right. One is, just that like horn is such an invasive sound to be putting under a solo flute playing in the middle register, right? So that's A, going all the way down to the low register. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is transcribing the pattern that is happening in the left hand of the pianist in the from the piano score, like immediately, like, like if you transcribe it, then we lose the sense of the rotation, right? You ha there, I think that there always has to be something a little bit more done to it for it to feel natural. Now, I mean, it sounds nice, and I like the way that you put in some harp notes to sort of like uh, punctuate the beginning of each of the rotating patterns. That's very, very cool. And this is really neat in the cellos and so on. Okay. And I, I love the the cushion in the background from the strings like there's a lot of really nice stuff set up here however the problem is um is the long notes right that's the problem is the is the long notes da 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 you know so that you've got these dotted eighth notes and the same thing like and then like for horn you not only do you have it muted which is very very like the muted sound is not going to make it subtle. It's going to make it more noticeable, right? Because it has a kind of a raspy sound. So, you know, if you want something that is that just that has the same ability to be incredibly soft, like the clarinet, the answer is the other clarinet, right? Or, um, you know, maybe violas or something, right? So, if you want something that just absolutely beautifully cushions and is just incredibly soft. Or you could have both of these parts going, and you could have the harp playing the rotating pattern, right? So what what we really want is the rot the sense of the rotating pattern more than the, than we want da 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 da, right? The the long note, the long note, the long note. You know what I'm saying? Like after a while, you start to notice the long notes, and that's a shame because there's this you know you have this beautiful lush line right in here. I'm not so sure that we need the poco de poco a poco de crescendo right in here. All right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and then like right in here, you're keeping 
your horn's incredibly soft, or your first horn incredibly soft, and then you reach up for this F sharp, right when things need to get their softest. That's the, I mean, it is possible for your first horn player to be playing with a mute and to be playing up here and to play it soft, but it's really not like a typical thing. Why can't the, why can't the clarinetist do that, right? Why does it have to be the horn player? So yeah, I just I just feel that that that's that there's a way of doing this better right in here to just to especially to make it incredibly subtle, like Morendo, right? You're going down to triple P, and you're going for this high F sharp. So it does it. I'm 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 not saying it's impossible, but it kind of like does not compute, right? All right, so we're ending up here. Triple P. Uh, I love the Glockenspiel right in here. That's cool. E flat clarinet. That's that is workable. Yeah, very nice. Did you think of possibly adding um, like a non vibrato? Would be kind of nice to like keep it very very cool and distant, because after all, we want to convey a sense of icy distance. You know, we don't want it to be. We don't want it to be trying to be intimate, right? We it's like it's almost like an echo from far away, right? So you have. Um, been dancing and partying and going nuts, you know, and you, you danced your tail off and then well, the, at the end of it, you won your lady love and you're having this beautiful moment together and you're off in a scented bower with a, you know, far away from the party now and you can see the moonlight and, you know, you're looking down on the river and it's just the most beautiful moment. And then far away in the distance, you hear the party is still going on, right? So it's just, you know, and and under the cool moonlight, it has a, almost an icy kind of a sound, right? That's sort of the way that I kind of imagine this. But I, I really love the, the E-flat clarinet and the piccolo working in octaves, and then the oboes taking like a harmonic role, sort of thrown right in there, and the... Um, yeah, and the bassoons and so on. Very, very cool. All right, and then <clears throat> this is cool. So after this sense of icy distance, you have to go to intimacy, with, which is great with flute, right? But I would say, once again, like horn is, has too much weight, right? You've got a bass clarinet, use it, right? Have this played on bass clarinet. And then I think the rest of this can be, I think it's fairly good. I mean, right in here, what if you had a little bit of a crescendo to bring this line out more in the cellos? Right, because we're going from a sense of intimacy to a sense of su to suspense right at the end, right? I think Mysterioso, that might be more applicable, like, you know, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't see anything mysterious about this, right? I mean, I think you could just put it up here if you want everybody to read it. But the Mysterioso, once again, has to be something that you score into the score, right? It's like, it's some of these, <clears throat> some of these um, moods that, uh, that pianist composers put into their piano scores are cues for we orchestrators to uh, realize, right? And so if the score is scored mysteriously, then we don't really need to tell everybody to play mysteriously. It just is there, right? There's no way to play the score without it being mysterious. Okay, balance, right? So, uh, all right. Da-da-dum, da-da-dum. I think that this should actually be played by the left hand. This this entire thing, and it should be it should be notated like this, right? Ba ba bum, and then just like have the E on top, and it should be marked mezzo piano to everybody else's pianissimo, including the bass clarinet. Ba ba ba. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I love the bassoon, the role of the bassoon right in here. Okay, so one last little comment, and that is, just like the 
Alargondo bar just before C. Um, in the piano part, the pianist basically just puts the pedal down here and holds it to the end of the piece. And what does that mean? Da -da, keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going and it lasts still. The pedal lifts at the end. Right? So I feel that it is feels I feel that it's just a little unnatural to go da -da, bum, for these to be two separate things, right? Is there some way that you can just, you know, work out like maybe make this divisi like the first violins, like Divisi first violins, could hit this and just continue on holding while you added these um, uh, these harmonics with the other Divisi instruments. Or maybe just reorganized how this is going. But yeah, but if there was some way of just continuing to hold everything, right? And once again, muted horn like the mute does not make the horn necessarily i mean it, yeah it can it can help the it can help the hornist to play incredibly soft but just be aware that it is maybe it may be soft but it is still a harsh sound right if you really want the if you want a sound that is horn like but is incredibly soft you know it sort of has some of the same timbral characteristics as the horn but is just really 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 soft uh, then you should be giving it to the clarinet, right? Or both of these lines to the clarinet. But yeah, you, you know, I mean, just as long as you're aware of the implications of that, of the, of it having that slightly starchy sound, right? But I think that it, in the very least, you could be holding the piccolo and the flute and so on. And, and if this were, whether you keep this in horn or have this horn and clarinets or whatever, whatever happens try to have this continue on to the end along with everything else. I really love the harp right in here. So, um, so if you intend this to be a line that basically plays these pitches going up and this is the actual sounding pitch, then this should be notated over the same two pitches that happened before, right? So because the harpist wants to read the pitch that they're playing. They don't want to read the pitch that it's going to be sounding. So that is, once again, something I've been told that can't be fixed. And I'm just kind of shocked, really. Um, I, I feel that it is leading to a generation of bad harp scoring, right? with no uh, unintentionally bad harp scoring. With, um, you know, every time a harpist gets a part, the... They, they can't tell whether or not it's, it you know, like, <clears throat> we trended back towards really firmly, you know, before notation software, notation was trending back very, very firmly towards the, um, the note played being where you notated the harmonic for the harp. And because of whatever technological things it is going, you know, people are notating at the sound that they want. So if that was, if actually you wanted this to sound an octave higher, then, then forgive me, Yona, I'm not beating up on you in, in any case. But I'm just, just commenting on the fact that, like, that I just really feel that, that, that this is wrong, right? That if, if this is what it takes to get your mock-up to sound right, you know, so just just score the score the um, the pitches um, on the on the string that you want them to be played, right? Which will sound an octave higher. And then, if you're if you want your markup to work, then just mute those two pitches in the playback, and then add two invisible pitches in the in you know so that the mockup will play them right. But you know, everybody out there. Please notate your harp harmonics on the pitch the, uh, on the pitch of the string that they're going to be played. So, in other words, an octave lower than they're going to sound. Okay, but I mean, still a beautiful idea. Hm. You know, you could even do a slight. You could actually have this played on 
uh, C flat and F flat um, so that you don't have to replay these strings and they can just keep resounding, right? Oh well, uh, I shouldn't get too intricate about this. <clears throat> but anyhow, Jan, I mean, it's a very, very cool score. Just hugely enjoyable and a great way to get back into the swing after a few days off. So um, a, very, a very auspicious score to be looking at. Um, and uh, really enjoyed running through it and uh, kind of picking things apart. Now, you'll notice that my style here is not to tell you to do everything differently. It, it is like, here's your, I, my, my approach is this, and that is observing what you want to achieve with the orchestration approach that you've set out, and then figuring out how to make that work if it won't exactly work the way that you've got it, right? So that is my aim here, is to take the ideas that you've got, your your originality, and to see how best to realize it. You know, if there's anything you're possibly missing, if there's anything that could end up with a raised hand in rehearsal, and so on. And, you know, if you've got a 106-piece orchestra and each of those players is making anywhere from $75 to $125 an hour, um, it, you know, you really is, um, you know, the raised hand at rehearsal will cost you, you know, each raised hand will cost X amount of hundreds of dollars, right? So we want to make sure we get rid of, of as many of those as possible so that the rehearsal is not an educational, I mean, all rehearsals are educational experiences for the, um, for the composer and the orchestrator. But what we don't want is the, <laughs> the um, players to have to educate the um, uh, to have to educate the orchestrator or the composer with a raised hand. It's better to consult first, right? Like you know like if there's something you want the E flat clarinetist to do, talk to an E flat clarinet player or uh, talk to a talk to a clarinet player, especially one that is like maybe a, a second chair or third chair that plays a lot of auxiliary instruments, right? So just things like that, you know, or, or maybe, you know, listen to really, really, really soft muted horn to see whether or not that's the tone color that you want in a really delicate chord, those kinds of things. So anyways, like, thank you for so much work. I could tell that this score, you know, this has got just so much, um, <laughs> you know, it's got so much care and, um, and so much love for the material in it, right? So, like, when I see that, I just, it kills me to say anything at all critical. So I'm trying to be really constructive about it, and I hope that I achieved that. I hope I gave you some insights about orchestration that will help you in your craft or, or help you whip this into shape, because, I mean, before I was talking about how wouldn't it be, you know, like, how... What if this were the version that everybody played in the future, um, and it became you know very successful, and it was played hundreds of times a year or hundreds of times a decade? Then um, <clears throat> you know, but my, but what if it was? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I'm I'm not saying that it would be, but wouldn't it be, wouldn't wouldn't it be great if it were right? So. Just with, with that in mind, you know, just sort of thinking about getting the best and like the proportions and everything else and like how to make this like as, as have the most, um, uh, the most usability possible, right? That's what I'm always looking for as a pro orchestrator. Now, like a lot of people score their pieces in a way that is almost intended to just have one performance and they're happy with that, but, um, if I scored that way professionally, I would get a lot less work. So it's, you know, maybe that's a very mercenary way of looking at it, but it's just a practical way that keeps me, you know, it has, it has opened up avenues of artistic expression that I think I would not have had were I um, just scoring for one person in the audience, me, right? So anyhow, uh, with that, um, you know, Thanks so much for this score. Thank you for supporting on Patreon. That really makes a huge difference. And thanks to everybody out there who has um, watched all of these evaluations and is sticking with us to the very end here as we round on our last dozen or so scores. 
Um, you guys are troopers and you are really making a huge difference with your comments and likes and, and views and everything else. All right. It really makes a lot of difference to me too, to keep me going when, you know, normally things would start to fall off. I don't think we've had this many comments and this much support and it still could probably be a bit more. I think that a lot of people have not quite caught up yet with, um, with what's going on, but, um, I'm sure that there will be more in the future. So thanks everybody. Um, before and since. <laughs> now, on to the next evaluation.